The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, tree cats stab thought police with sharpened celery sticks, then toss them to den of hungry hexapuma kits. Warbound heads for the Hugos like a missile of mercy. Plus part 11 of our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have Scott Kroof, Creative Content Director of Evergreen Studios, the production company that's developing the new Honor Harrington movie. That project is well underway with a comic and an online gaming app in both Android and Apple versions. The comic is called Tales of Honor, and it's basically the retelling of first Honor Harrington novel on Basilisk Station. The visualization of Honor, Nimitz, and the Honorverse is really well done. Of course, it won't match everyone's idea of what it should be, but they've done a, an honorable job, I would say. I liked him quite a bit. We have book one, two, and three of that series now available. The online gaming app is called Tales of Honor The Secret Fleet. You can find links to both of those in the various app stores and at talesofhonor.com with hyphens between Tales of Honor. You can also find links to get the comics there. That's Tales of Honor, T-A-L-E-S hyphen O-F hyphen H-O-N-O-R dot com. Scott will give us the scoop on the movie and tell us where and when we might be seeing that and talk about the adaptation process. It's really a great interview. Plus, we find out more about him, the man in charge of the overall adaption process for the movie. He's been a producer on some really great movies, uh, such as Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Jumanji, and Pitch Black. And we continue our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. It's read by Bronson Pinchot. But first, here's the news. The June mass market paperbacks are out, and there are some great ones this month. First of all, there's Warbound, book three of the Grim Noir Chronicles by Larry Correa. This is the finale of the series, and this novel is nominated for a Hugo this year at the World Science Fiction Convention. Also out is Pirates of the Time Stream by Steve White. This is a really fun entry in Steve's Jason Thano time travel series. This one mostly takes place in the Caribbean of the 1660s, which means Captain Morgan and pirates. And, of course, the transhumanist and Toloi are out to subvert history, and Jason has to stop them, this time with a bit of witting or unwitting aid from the king of the pirates, Henry Morgan. It's well-researched. Steve just does a phenomenal job with that, of course, and a great read. Finally, we have Noah's Boy, book three in Sarah A. Hoyt's Shifter series. This is Sarah's contemporary fantasy series set in a small town in Colorado with characters who can transform into various were-creatures, like dragons. In this one, we find out the origins of the shifters and meet an ancient enemy that may destroy them. Warbound, Pirates of the Time Stream, and Noah's Boy. Get them right now in mass market paperback at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome Evergreen Studio Chief Creative Officer Scott Krupp to the podcast. Hi, Scott. Hi, Tom. How are you doing? Scott is the Chief Creative Officer at Evergreen Studios. Uh, he has produced, executive produced, and supervised more than 80 productions over the course of his career. He's run two film production companies and has over 30 years of experience producing and financing content. He's held leadership roles in such entertainment industry powerhouses as Intermedia, Interscope, Radar Films, and Embassy Pictures. Scott co-founded Radar Pictures and developed and produced such films as The Last Samurai and The Chronicles of Riddick. At Interscope, Scott produced and or supervised such film as Jumanji, Runaway Bride, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, Pitch Black, oh man, these are good ones, and the list goes on and on with some really great movies. At Evergreen Studios, Scott oversees the entire story world development for the new David Weber Honor Harrington Entertainment uh, Project, I guess is what we can call it, you can tell me, which is called Tales of Honor. This is not just the film project, although there is one, of course. Scott also oversees the new Tales of Honor comic and the storyline for the mobile games. 
two issues of the comic are already out. I read them last night. They're really good. I like them a lot. They did a great job with them. Um, highly recommend them. Scott, the first question uh, Honor Harrington readers are going to want to know, for the film and the other media properties, are you doing the books proud? Is this the honor that we love to read about? I think we're uh, going to do Honor very proud. You know, we have uh, gone to the length of actually reading all of the material, which in the case of the Honor Harrington and the various associated books is no small task. <laughs> um, and it's been a great pleasure. And, and one of the things that really attracted us so much to the material is how rich the world that David created is and how incredible the engagement of the fan base who have gone on to become you know, it's attracted other writers to write inside his world. It's attracted, you know, uh, techies and, uh, and, and very, uh, heavy nerds to <laughs> plunge in and, and work out tech details and work on the science. So the whole depth and breadth of the series is something that we really value as kind of we have a lot of information we know it in more details than probably most series ever um offer up because it has this tech component which is um really unusual uh so for us it's a kind of an ideal world to employ our kind of story, world, and world-building ideas. Um, so honoring it is absolutely important. Having said that, you know, I'm sure there are going to be some choices when you visualize um, parts of this world when we flesh out details that haven't been fleshed out in the books that will be not quite for everyone who is a, a, a you know, fan of the book, but I think we're trying to honor the spirit of it, the kind of under scientific underpinnings and kind of politics and history that David has built, and then do the things that you do when you're visualizing or dramatizing, which means, you know, maybe changing some things around, maybe simplifying things, maybe taking threads that happen in later books and pulling them up earlier, there'll be things like that um, as we engage with the audience and build out the audience. What's just been so great for us is that the support that we've gotten from David and from the fans on of the books already has been invaluable to our process. The Honor Harrington fans and the Weber fans will tell you what they think, won't they? Absolutely. You know, we have a place on their forum, um, you know, where we try to keep everyone apprised of the things that we're working on, where we get feedback and we listen to their feedback. You know, it's done in the spirit of we want to respect um, the basics, the basic tenets of the, the series. And we also want to hear why some of our choices, because as soon as you visualize something, you know, it's not going to be exactly uh, the way everyone's imagined it. David has even told me that, you know, people will tell him how they imagine a particular character, which is not at all what he's imagined or he thought he wrote. But, you know, the reaction and the interaction you have with a book series that you love, you're always trying to make it real in your head. So I'm not sure we can keep everyone totally happy, but we can definitely let people know that we're listening to what their feedback is and that we do take it into consideration. That said, we also try to, we're trying, our, our big objective is to take this wonderful universe that David has created and make it available and accessible to a much, much broader audience. 
the story that you're going to use for the film, I understand, the core of it will be from The Honor of the Queen, which is the second Honor Harrington novel. The limited signed leather-bound edition of The Honor of the Queen is out this month at Booksellers, by the way. It's a very special edition, the 21st edition that David Weber has signed. Beautiful book. Um, tell me, like, as a filmmaker and producer and looking at a series like this giant series, um, how do you pick where to start? Well, it's, it's interesting because as a filmmaker, I have to kind of look at it a couple of ways because, you know, I have a, a, a extensive background as a film producer um, and have adapted and developed many books and have worked a lot with creators, you know, like Chris Van Allsburg on Jumanji, you know, that you always look to find something that you think will work for the platform, the film platform, which is, you know, 90 minutes to, you know, two hours long, sometimes longer, um, has its own set of demands. And it's been, it's been interesting because I also, when I came to Evergreen and I've worked on this with many of the projects, that I've had in the past where I work on other platforms like gaming or television adaptations, things like that. Uh, and the whole idea here at Evergreen is that we develop the whole world so that it is accessible to gamers, to people who enjoy social media and, and consume content that way, people who watch digital content, webisodes, television and films. So I have to look at the whole property as which parts fit in the best in each different platform. And one of the things that I concluded, which may be uh, popular or unpopular with the fan base, is that Basilic Station, while it was a, it's a great story, it's where we meet Honor, it has a lot of cool and interesting things, not the least of which is that it has another sentient creature other than a tree cat, um, is, doesn't lend itself easily to a film adaptation. And when I looked at Honor of the Queen, which had more action it had honor in a greater variety of um, action situations, um, so you really got to see more about her. Nimitz has a much better role in it. It is the introduction to Grayson, which ultimately ends up being honor's other home. It just felt to me that that was a stronger place to start and a more active story for Honor, because in many respects, Honor is a, quite a bit of on Basilic Station as she's doing detective work and finding out what's going on and getting to know her crew, all of which, and earning the respect of her crew, all of which is really important, but I'm not sure that it makes for the big cinematic event. That was the reason that we decided to go with the comic books and start at Basilic Station so we could cover that because we thought it was crucial and important in establishing her character and the background relationship with key characters like Alistair McKeon. Um, and we thought our transmedia approach offered the opportunity to do that and really to flesh that out and, and do justice to it and to use that as a foundation to set up our film. Yeah, the um, the comic is really well done. It's written by uh, Matt Hawkins and uh, illustrated by Jung Gwyn Yoon. And I think that everybody, especially diehard fans, are going to love the, the conceptual, the concepts of the uh, the spaceships. And Honor is, really looks good in there. She's She's got the that character that you get from uh, the interiorizations in the Weber books. Um, you decided to go with Anna, uh, on Basilisk Station for the comic, and uh, 
you are going with the honor of the queen as sort of the core story of of the movie. What are you gonna are you gonna make web webisodes? Is that did I hear that? Well, one of the th the next thing that we're doing is you know on the gaming front, we've already done the strategy game you mentioned, Secret Fleet, where the action of it is is in a in a way parallel to Basilisk Station, except that it's fictitious characters, although there are some appearances of characters um, who appear later in the series. Um, but the kind of conceit of that is that the secret task force that that Haven is putting together to intervene um, on Basilisk Station when the stilty uprising that they orchestrated happens, that fleet is being masked and a, another uh, Manticoran crew or Manticoran crew, <laughs> all right, got to do the right pronunciation. It's, as we all know, it's a little confusing because uh, David has the correct way. The, uh, you know, audible audio books has a different way. So, Oh, yeah, that's a running joke here at Bain, uh, by the way. Or In any case, uh, you are playing the captain of a, a Manticoran ship and who's kind of uncovering that mystery of the massing of this Havenite force that is eventually would come into play but never actually makes it to on um, Basilisk Station because honor thwarts the serious. Um, so we have that game, but the other thing that we are now um, working on um, – just to kind of again to further give further depth and and feeling is and and I think we'll probably do this in lieu of webisodes although this might end up generating some webisodes too just because we're thinking of doing an adventure game uh, which would be a a story an adventure game like the Walking Dead or The Wolf Among Us, which are the kind of two big titles in the genre. Um, and what those are is that you are in a story, you play the lead character, and in that story you'll have an opportunity to meet Honor Harrington and be part of the whole drama that takes place on Basilisk Station. But you won't be doing the – on all. you'll be doing – aspects of the story that haven't been dramatized in um, in in the book we'll, so that we can create a whole new situation. And it's all about helping Honor to uncover the mystery of what's happening on Medusa and the whole plot that Haven has. So again, we're trying to use gaming to enrich and really create a full experience Experience for the on Basilisk Station fans, um, and help to really kind of create the right foundation, so that when we go to the Honor of the Queen film, you really feel like you have some background. You really know who Honor is. You really kind of know how things work in the Honorverse, or at least as much as is revealed in on Basilisk Station. So we think that helps build a broader fan base and and appeals to each one of these things appeals to a different fan base. You know, there are the fan base of comic book fans who, you know, love to read and collect comics. There the strategy game um, is really fun because it allows you to kind of learn some of the basic principles of warfare in the universe in a really fun way you know, to, to call it learning them, it's like you just are thrown into the frying pan and you get to engage in missile battles. So oh, yeah. when you see them in a movie, <laughs> it'll be really fun. I tried the games out, the apps, I uh, and they were, I blew up some spaceships. I'm not very into gaming, but uh, it was kind of fun. And it's very yeah, beautiful. Yeah, and we're trying to make it, we're trying to make, find the game, you know, Find gaming, and that's a, a lot of why we've um, we're interested in doing this adventure game because, in a way, it's um, more narrative than it is quick twitch point and shoot stuff. Mm -hmm. And the idea of 
you know, exploring the narrative and kind of finding ways to really do justice to such a well-conceived and detailed story just feels like it opens it up to a lot of different people, you know. That strategy game is really fun for people who love to blow up things. These adventure games are really fun for people who want to explore worlds or feel like they're sitting in the shoes of a character in a tense situation. Yeah. So the the idea of the story world then is to is to draw people from all these areas toward uh, toward the central story and and is it is the film the end product you're aiming at or is it just drawing them into this this world? I think the film is 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 one of I think that each one of the things that that I found in really looking at this you know the traditional way Hollywood does it is you wait until the film comes out usually until you finish the film and you're getting ready to market the film. And then everyone starts to think about games and, and webisodes and other and social media content. And it all happens kind of after the fact. And instead of adding kind of depth and breadth to the world and the property, it usually kind of mimics the film. Um, so in some ways, you know, oftentimes games that are based on films or released in association with films um, aren't quite as good because they aren't really anything new. And in our thinking is that we want to use each one of these platforms not only to appeal to different fan bases, but to also just give you a lot of of different ways that you can explore that the the world that David has created and and we can flesh it out so that the real at the heart of the whole story world idea is this idea that you're building a world that can be explored in a lot of different ways um, it can be explored if you're a gamer it can be explored by watching you know webisodes or you know, television, a lot of people, you know, a lot of fans of the Honorverse have talked to me and told me that they're not sure, you know, film would be great, but wouldn't a television show be even better because then you could cover all the details and all of the different characters. And as you guys know, there's no shortage of characters in the Honorverse. <laughs> I think David told me that they're over 3,200 which is like a lot. And it's funny because everyone kind of has a lot of different favorites. So, you know, in creating story worlds that can be explored on different platforms, it lets us access some of the characters who might not have made the cut for, you know, a tight action-packed two-hour movie, but we can kind of dig in and and bring them to life on another platform. It's a very appealing um, way of building narrative and and building an immersive world. Yeah, it's a, as a as somebody invested in the series and a reader, it sounds like exactly the right way the reader would like you to to go about it. Have you um now David has said David Weber has said several times how happy he is with the way you've involved him in the in the project. Um, as an adapter of his very of his novels into this very visual media, how do you get David uh, involved? How do you listen to him and, and translate that into what you need to do? Well, David is a he's a terrific partner on this. You know, he created all of this. He's made himself very available to us. Um, We've definitely, because we're doing it in this new and different way, we felt it's kind of core to our idea that we um, honor the creator and that we we consult with him. Again, it's not like there may be a few things that we end up doing that are not exactly what he had in mind or what the fans had in mind, but David has been is very practical and very open-minded about the fact that um, things have to change on these different platforms 
And as long as we remain true to the spirit of what he's created, he's open. He has his opinions, and as as you know, uh, having a relationship with David, you always know what his opinions are in detail, um, <laughs> because he he is a really detailed thinker about everything. So it's kind of been valuable to us just to go to David for gut checks about things, to talk to him about some of the things that we're thinking about and, and, and different ways of approaching things. And as I said, he's been really great because he kind of keeps us on track um, and we're kind of determined to be uh, basically true to the spirit of everything without being, you know, rigidly adhering to the letter of every detail that's written down in the book because the idea is to bring other artists in and let them play in this universe and build and expand upon it. So you got to leave some headroom for people. And, you know, David has certainly done that already with the book series by having other writers in the anthologies come in and write. And I think that he's, he's really enjoyed that. And the whole series has benefited by having that kind of expansion so that you really feel like you're building out these different aspects of the world and you're finding out about different characters. You know, we're very fond of the whole Crown of Slaves series oh, yeah. and, and all the characters that that introduced and and how those ended up coming into the the main series has been really terrific and you know that's a lot of the challenge and we certainly did this already with the comic book is we decided that we would frame the comic book with an incident from uh, In Enemy Hands which is the seventh book and it's great because it kind of says Honor is such a badass that she's being taken to her own execution, and then we start looking back on how she got there. And David, it was an idea that we came up with, and David was like totally open to it and really just thought, wow, that's so cool. Um, and that was really nice because it, let, it lets us play with some of these elements and bringing them up into the story. Uh, earlier on to kind of create that richness that I think everyone loves about the series. Yeah, absolutely. The um, the comic really, that framing device really works um, in the comic. It's And it sets Honor up as a, uh, it, it shows her for what she's going to become. And, and we know that this is somebody not not to uh, be messed with. Um, yeah, exactly. And the, the Cauldron of Ghost series is a lot of, uh, it's my favorite part of the universe. I interviewed uh David and Eric on it uh, last in, last month, and it's uh, it's hit the New York Times bestseller list. Yeah, yeah. we love we love that because the other thing that that is just so great about that, and and it, again, it's the, it's so nicely weaved together, um, is that whole the whole aspect of the Mason alignment and their sinister plan that is in place and in motion during Basilic Station. So it's really fun for us to think because I think that, and it's one of the things that, and we've just been thinking about it. And, and by the way, the process for us is still fluid enough where we're, we're playing with finding the right ways to build out the world and to build out the audience. And the fact that there's all this espionage and intrigue and this kind of whole dark side of genetic slavery and the Mason alignment and their kind of master plan, all of that makes what could be perceived as just purely military science fiction into full bore science fiction space opera with in the very best way with intrigue and mystery and you know you know dark secrets i think all of that is 
just feels like great dramatic material and stuff that that when we get it on its feet with actors performing it will be really juicy and really fun for a hopefully ever broadening audience because you know we think it's the kind of science fiction that if we open up the world and present it in the right way that we can hit the really broadest science fiction audience not just the niche of military science fiction you know yeah but well, we can really go out there and and, and just make it really a, a very populous story it sounds like um you're hinting that there may be a uh, victor and anton subplot in the in the screenplay i don't know if i can ask you that yet we don't you know we don't know about that i i gotta say we're definitely playing around with some ideas of that sort it's tricky and 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 this is the real challenge and it's why you know one of the reasons that we do things the way we do it is that the reality of developing a a screenplay that is really going to be good enough that we're going to really get the right talent involved with is it really takes time because you know a lot of times people want to simplify out, and, and it really is a challenge with with the um, with the honorverse material. Is that it's not very black and white. It's actually one of the incredible virtues of the piece, in my opinion, and all of the work, is that there on any side there's the full spectrum of good guys and bad guys. You know, there are plenty of truly hateful havenites like, you know, Cordelia Ransom or Oscar Saint-Just, but there are an incredible number of really smart and heroic people like Thomas Theismann and Eloise Pritchard who are really that, the fact that it has that kind of range, it's very tempting to put complexity in and and really try to show that and that's a real challenge in a screenplay because you only have so much real estate and obviously a big part of the real estate of a big sci-fi series like this is we better have some pretty great action you know we got to have some incredible battles we got to have a that incredible assassination scene where Nimitz and Honor defend Protector Benjamin. It's you know, Protector Benjamin Mayu. That's all got to be, it takes time. You got to be do justice to it. People in this day and age don't really expect uh, action sequences to be short. <laughs> you know, based on uh, the trend that we've seen in the Marvel movies, you know, it's like you can figure a lot of times the, the action sequences are, you know, 20 minutes long. Um, so it's tricky to figure out how to service all of the plots. And that's one of the things that we've done as we've been developing is we found that we want that character depth and complexity. And when you do that, it becomes the balancing it um, into the film format is really the challenge. So uh, we're hard at work on that. A lot of the, the depth of the character can just, uh, you know, that's the great thing you can do with movies. Um, you know, David has three paragraphs, and, and an actor can show the same thing in a twitch of his, of his lips or a raising of an eyebrow. Absolutely. You know, we haven't really thought about it. There have been some great suggestions from the fans. Um, I kind of feel like, you know, I'm not sure that it's someone who's already a big star. Um, you know, there's a lot of physical challenges to the way David has described Honor. She's supposed to be six foot two, incredibly athletic, uh, slightly Eurasian, um, all very tricky. So, you know, I and and even though she's um, 50 t years old when we meet her, she's supposed to look like she's in her late 20s, early 30s because of the prolonged treatment. So my guess is that 
it's going to be someone who's bubbling up right now who may may be someone who's already hit or it may be someone who is coming up. The physical presence of honor is an incredibly important aspect of her character. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure that we're going to get a six foot two um, actress, <laughs> but whoever it is, they're going to have to feel like they're six foot two. You know, we have a lot of ways in movies to make people seem big enough and all of that. But, but I think it, the main thing is to have the bearing and to be a person who looks quite young but has an enormous amount of command and presence. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, I always have hope because I look at, you know, Hunger Games and, you know, Jennifer Lawrence is just such perfect casting for it, and she has such incredible presence. And honestly, she before she did that, she was in an independent movie. I kind of feel like that's going to be how it works for us. There'll be someone who's just starting to come on the scene, who's got the right talent and the right feel, and uh, that'll be our honor. So to kind of, it's fun to play name games with casting, but, but a little bit, sometimes you end up thinking of people who are more established, so then they suddenly become a little too old to be true to the tenant that she's supposed to look so young. What about Nimitz? How are you going to do that? Well, I don't know if there is really a tree cat out there who could play Nimitz, <laughs> um, but maybe. Uh, Nimitz is, you know, it's already, we've already uh, gotten a, a lot of feedback on Nimitz um, because we've kind of, and, and, and we've showed art, you know, one of the things that you have to understand about comic books is, you know, and, and early art on anything is it's never, it's never quite the totally finished product. In fact, I can promise you that the Nimitz in the comic book will, what the Nimitz in the movie looks like will be really extremely different. Um, because in the comic book, it's kind of about an attitude. And one of the things that we, and we talked with David, and, and he warned us that many people would be probably not so happy with the notion, but we felt for a couple of reasons that we didn't want to do Nimitz as kind of cute and fluffy as he is initially portrayed in the books. Of course, we ultimately come to realize that he's super tough and uh, can be very deadly. Um, but we felt for a couple of reasons that we wanted to make Nimitz a little tougher, a little more formidable, a little more alien, so that it's a little less, the, uh, you know, oh, it kind of looks like a cat, but it has six legs. So we've been working, and, and we are in process. It's Nothing is written stone yet, but we're working on a tougher version. And, and frankly, the initial versions in the comic book uh, don't even have fur on them. You'll, know, you'll, you'll, you'll see some evolution with that, and the fans will see it in the comic book. And then also, you know, if we do an adventure game, uh, there might be a tree cat in it, and that's going to look different. But when you get to the movie, the real challenge, and this is the, the major challenge, and I think Nimitz is the toughest thing in the whole series in a lot of ways, is that he has to be very real looking because the, the overall feeling that David has created in the series is very grounded, realistic, scientifically, politically kind of solid. Um, so he can't be something that breaks the reality. He can't suddenly look like he's a creature out of Star Wars or even Star Trek. He, he, I think he, at least this is our thinking right now, we think he has to look pretty real so in doing that, we have to keep working 
because he's a present character. I'm not sure that, yeah. you know, we, we've talked with David about the idea that our vision of him as a film character is that he is slightly more independent, not so much seemingly honors Pat on her lap or all of that. There'll be moments of that because that's what their relationship is, and we've got to be true to that. But I don't think we want it to be quite as present um, as it feels in the book, um, because I think that it's supposed he's supposed to be an alien, sentient creature, and in fact, a sentient creature who may or may not be more intelligent than humans. So... I feel like it's kind of on us to make that feel convincing and real um, so that we don't break the overall kind of tone of the piece. Um, so as I said, we're just, we work on it every single day. We talk about it. We've, you know, we're working on animation tests to make sure that we create a hexapetal creature that is really convincing in its movement because as we know, there are no examples of them uh, on Earth. So we really was, we're working away on that. And the same thing, you know, it's a challenge with the Stilties. We get to do them in comics, thank God, initially, just because three legs, three arms, boy, is that going to be a super challenge <laughs> to animate. Um, fortunately, we don't have to do it just yet. But again, we've got to make that really convincing because they're the other sentient creature that have been announced. So uh, we have to kind of figure a way to do justice to that. So cool. as I said, it's a, a constantly evolving process. Speaking of the, the script, what state is it in? Um, are you ready to go with it? You know, we're still working on it. We, we got a draft that, that we thought was a little – oversimplified, a little too black and white. It hit the beats, kind of the big beats, but it didn't have the level of character that we wanted and and kind of the 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 balance, you know, um because and 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 one of the things about Honor of the Queen is it's kind of a sophisticated story because you have this burgeoning war between Manticore and Haven, but then you have this conflict between the Graysons and the Masadans, and to get that across in a clear way that is engaging and emotional is pretty, proved to be pretty complicated, and when we tried to simplify it, we weren't particularly satisfied with what we got, so we're working away at it to try to give it the right level of texture and richness. I, I think it's safe to say we're in process, but I don't feel that um, we're there yet, yeah. you know, so, and, and, and we're going to be pretty, our standards on this are going to be pretty high because to put together a movie you really have to have great parts for an actor and, and a great kind of presentation to attract the right kind of director for this. Well, um, I'd like to, you know, I rattled off all those, uh, all those credits uh, in introducing you, and it, I'd like to digress just for a moment and, and hear about you sure. personally. Um, you've had a really cool career in entertainment. Um, how did what brought you to to this spot? How'd you get into it? And uh, tell us some some of uh, the Scott Krupp story, if you would. Well, I'll give you I'll give you uh, the quick and hopefully exciting version. As I started off, I studied uh, theater, and I was a theater director, um, and I uh, ended up in the. I went to University of California at Irvine. I ended up in the final year in order to be able to direct a full-length play and to be given a meager budget for it. I ran um, a theater where we produced student shows, plays, dance recitals, art pieces, all sorts of different art performance pieces, 
all sorts of different things. So I started producing then. Um, I didn't get into film right away. I was a theater director for a little while, which did not make me uh, an enormous amount of money, so I actually had to get a job. And <laughs> since I'd run a theater, I knew how to do lighting design and set design and that sort of thing. And as it turned out, I worked in the nightclub business and, and on music shows as a lighting designer and a set designer. Um, so I got more and more background, and as that evolved, I started working on film crews, uh, and then I really decided that I wanted to be more on the kind of story and and um, content side, so I kind of bit the bullet and became a script reader and worked for a bunch of different companies um, reading uh, scripts, and, you know, someone told me, that I wouldn't really know anything about story until I had read a thousand scripts. So I thought, well, okay, I better get a job. If I'm going to have to read all those scripts, someone's got to pay me for it. <laughs> um, so I did that, and then I ended up working as um, a story editor at Embassy Pictures and got raised up to being a production executive there and then got an opportunity to go out and be a producer uh at Interscope, and... What does that mean, Scott? Perfect job. What? Well, what it means is um, when you're a story editor, what you do is you read scripts, you look for writers, you look for properties, you know, um, and you manage the other readers who do that. As a production executive, you then start to supervise movies, the development of movies and the production. And one of the reasons, and when I went to uh, Interscope, um, which was a production company, um, it also had its own money to do development. So we would develop properties. We would then take them, set them up at studios, and then uh, we would produce them. And the way we did it um, at Interscope was we believe that the person who develops the script should be the person who sits on the floor of the movie and produces it, should be the person who is fully involved with post-production and with the marketing of the movie. I was lucky enough to work with um, Robert Court, who was the president of Interscope at the time, um, and Robert Court used to be the head of marketing at Fox in Columbia, so I learned a lot about marketing from him and not only, you know, what movies people like to see, but ways of getting, making sure that your movie really engaged the audience. Um, and that kind of, it was Robert and then Ted Field, who was the owner and the founder of the company. We all had this belief that you really see it through from start to finish. Um, and that's how to give yourself the best shot at making the best movie that has the best chance of connecting with an audience. Um, and so I worked my way up, and, you know, one of the first movies I worked on was Bill and Ted, which was, like, <laughs> such a pleasure for me and is incredibly near and dear to my heart um, just because, one, is it, it kind of has stood the test of time and people still love it. Uh, and we didn't have a lot of money, um, but I was able to kind of like do everything. I had a great relationship with the director, Steve Herrick. I had a great relationship with Ed Solomon and Chris Matheson, who were the writers, and with Alex Winter and Keanu Reeves and George Carlin. We were really tight, and everyone was determined to make kind of this incredibly lighthearted movie that had a really good kind of positive message. And we really had a blast on it. And I ended up, you know, having to, you know, take a camera and go and get other shots and do little second unit things. Uh, and it was really fun. Um, and it was also kind of the most, one of the most harrowing experiences for me because the company that made it was uh, DEG, which was Dino De Laurentiis' company, and we finished the movie, and then 
the company went bankrupt. And sure, I remember all that happening. That was it, yeah. yeah, literally was on the precipice of just being thrown directly to a, a cable deal, right? Which in those days was like really like after we had worked so hard on that. And then we were only going to get out on cable and there would be no publicity and, you know, it would be really hard for uh, people to discover it. And I went on like a crusade and fortunately um, uh, one of the former executives at DEG, a guy named Rick Finkelstein, who went on to become a major executive at Universal Studios, he was at another company and we kind of schemed to go to the people who were presiding over the bankruptcy of Bill and Ted and say, hey, listen, we'll give you 10 cents on the dollar. Um, and the movie was bought for Nelson Entertainment, who then took it and got it released. And, of course, the funny thing was the whole process with the bankruptcy and all of that, they never tested the movie. You know, some guy looked at it and said, I don't think this is going to do anything, but they never tested it. And the first thing we did when Nelson bought it is we tested it, and it was really like a great feeling because it tested great. Yeah. People loved it. It was one of those movies. It wouldn't, didn't have big stars. You know, Keanu was not a big star at the time, um, and – it was a movie that people found, and it was so great because when we actually got it in the theaters, it just kept playing in a way that movies don't do very much anymore, where it just hung in there and played for like eight weeks and built up this great fan base, and we were able to do a, a sequel, and you know, it was my first little exposure to transmedia because we ended up doing a Saturday morning cartoon show that... Keanu and Alex and George Carlin did, and it was just like, it was a very, it was a terrific experience. It made me an incredible believer in you've got to see things through all the way, and you constantly have to keep working to find ways to get the audience to engage with your material. Sometimes it's like being good at development, and sometimes it really is being good at marketing or listening to audience response like the response we get from the Weber fans on the forums honestly I mean some of it kind of makes us crazy but at the same time it forces us to think about it and think about our choices and are we making the best choice and we have to kind of like both honor the fans and we also have to say but you know, you guys like it, but isn't part of what we all want to do is to get a lot of people to like it. So we're going to have to think of some ways to make things a little more accessible. Um, and that's, that. you know, that was a great experience in my past. And, you know, I, I had great experiences on so many of the films. I had a great experience doing Jumanji. I loved working with Chris Van Alsberg, whose work I still love, and I'd love to figure out how to do some of his other pieces. I had an incredible experience working on Pitch Black and learned a lot, actually, about gaming from Vin Diesel, who is a super smart guy <laughs> about that. That's a really excellent movie, too. That's the, like Bill and Ted's, um... Excellent adventure. Place Black is one you go to and you have a good time and then you come out and you start thinking about it and you realize there's something more to it, you know. I mean, again, it was we had a really devoted team. David Tuey, who wrote and directed that, who I had worked with on a couple of projects, really created a, a, a great world. And we were, again, super lucky because we got Vin Diesel, who, you know, the moment you met him, you knew he was going to be a gigantic star, but he also was, he's just a really great creative force. And as I said, I learned a lot about the gaming thing from him because when we did Chronicles of Riddick, he very much wanted to be hands-on involved with the game because he is a gamer and he loves it. And he's been a gamer ever since he was a kid. 
and he had the great idea, um, which was really forward thinking at the time, is we're not going to do the Chronicles of Riddick story. We're going to do a story that takes place between Pitch Black and Chronicles of Riddick that helps fans know a little bit more about the world, know a little bit more about Riddick's character. And man, they killed that game. It was I, I, it was really fun for me because I get to read the scripts. They really developed it, both in smart story ways, but also in incredibly smart gaming ways. And it got, you know, incredible reviews, and in, in you know was a huge hit. Um, and people still look at it as really like an example of that's the right way to do gaming surrounding a movie. So, you know, that lesson that I kind of learned in the process of that is a big part of the way we're looking at the honor verse is how can each one of these different experiences help you dig into this world and have fun with it, you know, and know more about it because to be honest, you know, the the books are are like it's a big there are a lot of them and what I'm trying to do is find ways to hook people just enough so they just go ah no I've got to go and read the books now got to yeah. get all the details yeah. you know that part of it is really fun because it's just such a wealth of information there and we can have a lot so much fun with it absolutely. Well, Scott Kroof is Chief Creative Officer at Evergreen Studios and the man in charge of the overall media development for David Weber's Honor Harrington series adaptation, Tales of Honor. Uh, we can't wait to see what y'all come up with next, Scott. Thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. And now here is part 10 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic, as read by Bronson Pinchot. This portion of Hard Magic is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Here's what has gone before. It's the 1930s in America, but it's an America that's been magically changed. In the 1860s, a handful of people from all walks of life were visited with special magical talents. And each generation more are so affected. These people are called actives. Most actives use their powers for good, but some do not. Jake Sullivan is a private eye. He's also a former soldier, an ex-con, and an active heavy, the type of active that controls the force of gravity. This is something Jake is quite good at. After working for J. Edgar Hoover's Bureau of Investigation and getting thrown out of a dirigible for his trouble, Jake is perplexed about why he was sent to capture Delilah Jones, a brute, a kind of active, who was accused of working with the mob. Now Jake has stirred up the mob, and a rogue hitman is planning Jake's demise to add a notch to his gun stock. But also interested in Jake are some altogether more impressive actives who may or may not wish Jake ill. Jake, meanwhile, fast asleep in his hotel room home, had better get ready for visitors. Here's Bronson Pinchot with part 11 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. Chapter 5 Gentlemen, we have now reached the last point. If any one of you doesn't mean business, let him say so now. An hour from now will be too late to back out. Once in, you've got to see it through. You've got to perform without flinching whatever duty is assigned you, regardless of the difficulty or the danger attending it. If it is steering the clouds and calling down lightning, if it is hurling fire or steel, if it is breaking the Germans' will or dragging their battle zeppelins from the sky, if it is the closest kind of fighting, be anxious for it. You must know your power, how to shoot, and how to stay alive. No matter what comes, you mustn't squeal. Think it over, all of you. If any man wishes to withdraw, he will be gladly excused, for others are ready to take his place. General Theodore Roosevelt 
from speech given to 1st Volunteer Brigade, active before Second Battle of the Sum, 1918. Chicago, Illinois Sullivan tossed and turned, fevered dreams eating at his peace. Finally he gave up and lay there, shirtless and sweating, miserable and sick, partially awake, his mind still running through the remnants of a muddled dream. Fields of mud and broken trees sticking out of the ground like splintered bones, and so many zeppelins in the air that they seemed to blot out the sky. The Germans, they just kept killing over and over and over while the Kaiser's sorcerers would just wake them up and send them back into the fray until their bodies had been so pulverized that they could no longer hold a rifle and his brother getting half his face torn off by artillery and General Roosevelt dying in a spray of blood and fire under the claws of a summoned and... Then he was awake. Sullivan sighed, staring at the dark ceiling. His internal clock told him that it wasn't even close to morning, but he wouldn't be falling back asleep any time soon. He decided that the dream must have been from talking to Lenny. It had reminded him of the bad old days. He heard flapping at the window, and at first he dismissed it as just a pigeon, but it sounded too leathery. Sullivan just kept breathing deep, listening. Amish McCleary didn't like being called a retard, but he was too scared of Mr. Torrio to complain about it. He would prove to the boss that he could pull his weight around here, and that he wasn't just good for eavesdropping on meetings with bootleggers and hustlers. He was going to pop the heavy himself. The big lug had a reputation. He was supposed to be a real tough guy, a hard case, but Amish knew nobody was that tough when they were asleep in bed and you kicked in the door and sprayed them down with a Tommy gun. Who cared if he was asleep? The word on the street would still be that Amish McCleary had been the man who'd had the balls to take down heavy Jake Sullivan. That would show Mr. Torrio. Even Al Capone would have to respect him after that, and maybe then nobody would make fun of his cross eyes any more. The Jap sat next to him in the front of the Packard. Amish was scared of Mr. Torrio, but he was terrified of the Jap. One time, Amish had gotten curious to see if the Japs thought the same as white men, so he'd used his power to try to read him. Even though Mr. Torrio had warned him not to, it was like his power had hit a brick wall. Amish wasn't a very strong reader. His power barely worked once in a while, and he could only really get into the heads of the really dumb when he tried to read smart people, he just kind of bounced off. The Jap hadn't just bounced him, he'd booted him out of his head and across the street. Amish's head had ached for the last three days straight. The Jap didn't bother to look at him, like he was too good to give Amish the time. The demon returns, he said simply. The Jap must have had really good hearing, because Amish didn't hear the wings flapping until ten whole seconds later. Mr. Torrio's imp settled on the side mirror and squawked at him. Amish listened for a second. He didn't speak demon good like Mr. Torrio, but he could get the gist of it. The heavy's asleep. Let's go. The Jap held up a hand. Send one man in first to make sure the lobby is clear. Amish hesitated. Mr. Torrio had put him in charge, not the Jap. He didn't know who the Jap was supposed to be or who he worked for but all of a sudden he thought he could give the orders. But Amish hesitated because, first off, the Jap scared him to death, and second, it was a good idea. Daniel Garrett checked his pocket watch for the fifth time. It was almost three o'clock in the morning. It is exactly two minutes from the last time you checked, Heinrich stated, not looking away from the window. The German seemed nonchalant as he watched the nearly empty street in the front of the Rasmussen Hotel, but Heinrich was always composed. The entire world could be exploding around them in flames, and Heinrich would still play it cool. Well, sorry, I don't have your Teutonic nerves of steel, Daniel muttered. Are they moving? Nein, only the one went inside, probably to check the registry. The others are still waiting. We should take them now. There's at least six of them, 
All the reason to go now. Element of surprise, my friend. The two of them had arrived on the last dirigible of the evening. A contact at the Chicago police had told them where Jake Sullivan was staying. The Grim Noir Society prided itself on having contacts everywhere. Daniel leaned forward so he could see out the stolen Chrysler's passenger side window. He did not like stealing automobiles or blimps, but they were in a hurry. And besides, they always left the things they'd borrowed where they could be found when they were done. He had to shove his glasses back up his nose. His natural vision was terrible. You don't even know who they are. We're staking out this particular hotel because of our mysterious heavy, and a group of suspicious men arrive and are also watching the same hotel. Coincidence? Daniel thumped his head dramatically on the steering wheel. Figures. I wonder what Sullivan did to tick them off. I do not know, but he seems to have that effect on people. Heinrich rubbed his jaw. Jane had mended it good as new, but Daniel knew from personal experience that a magically fixed bone would still ache for days afterward. It was obvious the society's best fade felt guilty for letting a heavy knock him out. You don't sneak up on fades, they sneak up on you. I've already said it once, but I do not have a good feeling about this heavy. Don't feel bad. You should have seen the information the general gathered on this one. You're lucky he didn't eat you. Wouldn't be the first German he's done in, I figure, Daniel said, trying to make his young friend feel better and failing. They quit pinning medals on his chest when they ran out of room, and you saw how big he was. I don't trust him. Maybe the Imperium is here for the same reason as we are, Heinrich mused. What do we do then? Daniel didn't answer at first. He didn't think he had to. It was open season on anybody who worked for the Imperium, and if they hired the heavy, then he was fair game too. You don't even know their Imperium. I can smell... Heinrich shifted. He's coming back. Daniel leaned forward again so he could see a man walking quickly from the hotel entrance to the parked autos. They conferred through the windows for a moment. After some discussion, doors opened and men began to pile out. Long guns were removed from the vehicles and quickly covered in loose coats. The man who stepped from the passenger seat of the lead vehicle was familiar, Japanese, dignified, and Daniel swore under his breath as recognition came. He looked just like the photographs smuggled out of Manchuria. That's Rokusaburo. Told you so, Heinrich said. Imperium Scheisse. The Japanese killer pulled a thin, three-foot black object and held it under his long coat as he walked casually toward the hotel entrance. An iron guard here in the U.S.? I can't believe this. Damn it. I wish we had the rest of the crew. Dan moved to start the car. They would need to alert the general that one of the chairman's best men was in the States. There was no way just the two of them could take on an iron guard. There were other grim noir in the Midwest, and if he could raise enough of a force in time, they might be able to... Heinrich, what are you doing? He hissed as the young German opened his door. I'm going to go and talk to this heavy like Herr General ordered, he smiled as he got out. Coming? Are you crazy? Daniel said. Rakuza Buro will cut us to bits. He can't be killed. Heinrich shrugged. He is magic. He's not immortal. Daniel banged his head on the steering wheel again. Amish and two Torio men, Brick and Hoss, stepped out of the elevator on the tenth floor. The Jap trailed them silently a few feet behind, his long black coat almost hitting the carpet. Amish had left the two others covering the lobby. He wasn't expecting this to be too hard. The imp couldn't tell them a room number. It wasn't like it could hop down the brightly lit hallways like a miniature kangaroo checking room numbers. It peeked through windows. That's about all the stupid thing was good for, but the logbook at the desk had Sullivan's blocky signature under room 109. So that's what Amish was looking for. 
He draped his overcoat on top of his tommy gun, not that he needed to bother. The desk clerk had been passed out drunk. He tossed the coat over his shoulder as he rounded the corner and spotted the gold numbers for 109. That was part 11 of the complete audiobook serialization of Hard Magic by Larry Correa, as read by Bronson Pinchot. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, thanks to Julie Karakov, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz, and a Hollywood walk of the stars down the long arm of the Milky Way, and a case of old Tillman cold ones, with thanks and gratitude to Scott Kroof, Chief of Creative Content at Evergreen Studios, and producer in charge of the new Honor Harrington Film Project. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Mm-hmm.